Good evening. I'm Terry Thornton. I'm curator of education here at The Modern. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's special presentation. Um, as you all know, I think you would all know, uh, Doug Aiken Electric Earth officially opens um, to the public this weekend. So tonight is a preview. So you should consider yourself very special. Um, and you are. Um, if um, you have seen this show, I don't have to tell you how beautiful, engaging, and electrifying it is. Doug Aiken has famously noted that, quote, the museum should be a structure for broadcasting, an antennae that reaches far and wide, well beyond its walls. This boundless um, exhibition embodies that charge, and I, for one, appreciate the challenge that it poses. We have some incredible programming this summer through the duration of the exhibition. And just for one, I want to be sure that everybody notes that um, in addition to the exhibition that's upstairs, there's also running films in the auditorium. So be sure that you check out the schedule for that. And then on um, the first Tuesday, which I believe is June 6th of um, June, we um, begin the summer film series. And this summer, we have um, the privilege of having all of the films recommended by Doug Aiken. So they're all road films. And we're going to start with the best road film ever, Station to Station, which is Doug Aiken's own film. So please uh, mark your calendars and plan to be here. Um, to kick off what is sure to be a memorable summer with Doug Aiken Electric Earth, we have invited the artists Doug Aiken and Philippe Verne, the curator of the exhibition, to be here tonight to engage in a conversation in which they will share stories of the exhibition's making, discuss ideas critical to the work, as well as screen the filmic documentation of some, of, uh, some extraordinary endeavors since the exhibition opened just this past fall. Um, Doug Aiken is in the midst of um, a distinguished and ambitious career with a resume that merits 25 pages at the back of the exhibition catalog for Electric Earth, which gives an impressive list of selected publications, screenings, installations, site-specific projects, um, the exhibition, and exhibitions that span the globe. He participated in the 1997 and also the uh, 2000 Whitney Biennial and won the International Prize at the Venice Biennale in 1999 for the installation Electric Earth, which of course is in this exhibition and is the title piece for the exhibition. His groundbreaking exhibition, Sleepwalkers, at MoMA in 2007 was met with much critical acclaim. Um, awards uh, include the 2007 uh, German Film Critics Association Award at the Kunst Film Biennale in 2009. Um, and the um, 2012 Namjoon Paik um, Art Center Prize, and um, the Smithsonian Magazine American Ingenuity Award for Visual Art in 2013. Such acknowledge acknowledgments come as no surprise as Doug has to be one of the most um, driven and adventurous artists um, to have ever lived. Um, I don't think that's an overstatement. Um, as I understand it, he leaves here with projects awaiting him in Denmark and in Basel, making his time here even more appreciated. Philippe Verne is the director of MOCA um, in LA, um, where Electric Earth, um, the exhibition, was originated. Um, he began there in 2014. Prior to his appointment at MOCA, he served for five years as director um, of the DIA Foundation in New York. And before, leaving, uh, before leading the DIA Foundation, he served as deputy director and chief curator at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis. So in addition to his significant contribution to the direction and scholarship of contemporary art, we owe Philip, uh, Philippe Verne our appreciation for, while at the Walker, bringing us the amazing Kara Walker exhibition that was here in 2008. And I think most of you will recall that. In 2006, um, Philippe co-curated the Whitney Biennial with uh, Chrissy Isles. And since 1992, he has organized and curated exhibitions um, all over the world. Um, in 2015, he was awarded the Legion of Honor in recognition of his 24 years of service to the arts. Um, the accolades for Philippe, 
um, as a respected uh, curator and leader in the contemporary art discourse are justifiably extensive. But unfortunately, my time is short. So suffice to say, with both Philippe and Doug, we are in very good, we're in remarkable company tonight. So please join me in welcoming Philippe Verne and Doug Akins. Good evening. It's really nice to be here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Philip. Hi. Nice to see you. <laughs> um, you look familiar. Do you come here often? <laughs> um, it's very, it's very nice to be to be back uh, to be back here. I see some faces. Uh, whom I met this morning, so you're hardcore people, uh, you want more, uh, that's, uh, that's great. Um, what are we going to do? We are going to talk. Uh, we've done that before, we, talk, we call that uh, the dog and pony show, I'm the pony. Uh, <laughs> and uh, don't, don't get any idea, it's uh, <laughs> just, just a pun. Um, we, uh, the show is here, so We'll talk about the work, of course. We'll talk about the exhibition, uh, but we also we will talk. And Doug, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Doug will show uh, two films that actually uh, have of work that have happened uh, after the exhibition, and uh, one of them during, and one one of them during, but a film that have or works, film about work that expand the notion of what an exhibition can be and what a museum should do. And then I have a few questions that I will ask Doug. He, has, he doesn't know the questions. Some of them are uh, coming out of left field and are curved ball. No. <laughs> Some of them I stole uh, from you. Uh, and we'll talk about that later if we have time to get there. Um, and uh, maybe if I think your wish was to start by showing the first film, and then we kick off uh, a conversation. That sounds great. Um, so hello, and, uh, and thank, thank you all for being here and uh, you know, coming early to the exhibition. Uh, it's been fascinating working on it. Um, it's, it's interesting also when you think about how exhibitions can change as they travel. And, um, you know, I think initially, um, <clears throat> Philippe approached me to, to create a show of, of works. And, um, and it was something I had a hard time getting my head around. I, I, I was, I'm not dead, I don't think. Um, so I, I, yeah. I, I didn't feel that. No, I'm just <laughs> um, So I, I, I really, um, I was trying to kind of find a starting point, and um, and I think I think the starting point became to make an exhibition that doesn't really have a sense of time or place, and I wanted something where the viewer could really go in and kind of fall into these works, have a dialogue with these works, um, kind of author their own experience. Um, I didn't want something that was um, controlled or chronological. So I think what we have here at Fort Worth and at MoCA, um, there are two quite different exhibitions in a lot of ways. Um, Los Angeles was much more um, non-linear, it was much more open. And I think the architecture here really kind of informed us how to make a very different show, a show that was almost a series of chapters that you could kind of um, move through and discover. And I think as you go deeper into the exhibition, you find a work might be hiding down a corridor to the left of you or to the right, or you see something where you think the wall ends, but actually there's another work be behind it. And I, I really like this idea of kind of a, a labyrinth. And, um, and going back to what Philippe was talking about a moment ago, um, there's two short clips that we wanted to share with you, which are other works which don't exist inside a museum. And um, the, um, the first piece is titled uh, Underwater Pavilions. And um, as we were... Um, uh, developing this exhibition, I, I started thinking to myself, I, I, I had this strong desire to make a work that was um, uh, kind of outside of 
the museum and gallery space. And, um, and I think there, there is an incredible history in America, in North America, of works like that. Um, we especially look at land art, Robert Smithson, Terrell, um, Michael Heiser, Walter De Maria. We see works that are out there in the landscape in the desert. And, you know, we also see urban art, street art, things like that. These are all kind of forms of art that, you know, that, that, that kind of secede from the museum in a certain way. And I thought about this, and I thought that really for myself, I find I, I live not far from the Pacific Ocean, and I'm constantly walking out there at, at dawn every morning. And um, I walk out there, and it, for me, it's almost a way of kind of looking into the future. I see this horizon with no representational imagery, and you know, sometimes it's misty, sometimes it's clear, but it's just this kind of very minimal line, and it, it's like looking into a new set of possibilities, like hitting the reset button. And I was thinking about this, and I thought, really, the work that I would like to make isn't in an urban space, it's not in the desert, it's, it's in the ocean. And you think about the ocean, you think about over 70% of the Earth is underwater. And it's this incredible topography, teeming with life, um, mysterious and powerful. And is there a way that we could use this, that we could activate this? So I started designing a work, and the work was um, three three sculptures that were uh, suspended below the ocean surface, um, 10, 20, 30 feet. And each of these artworks was um, a kind of structure that was partially mirrored, so they created um, large-scale kaleidoscopes. And another part of them was a kind of material that allowed sea life to grow on them, so they could eventually become living, living sculptures, a living installation. So um, Philippe was an incredible collaborator, and um, we and MOCA, our studio, and um, uh, Ocean Conservation Group called Parlay for the Oceans all kind of um, got together, and we somehow, I have no idea still how this happened, we somehow found a way to make this, um, this underwater installation. Um, the work was in the Pacific, and um, next, uh, we, we just got back from the Indian Ocean, and it will, um, it will go to the southern Maldives to um, an uninhabited atoll, and it will be there, and um, hopefully uh, provoke uh, a new coral reef, and um, a lot of love. He life. came back. I, I, <laughs> half a day job. that trip. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, uh, maybe we could um, show maybe, be, short clip. maybe be, before we, we, we send the, the clip, I just want to comment on a few things that you said, because I think it's very informative to, to talk about that, to understand the way you work. A uh, few things. The, the way you first you, you were talking about the exhibition that, that we did together. Um, there are different ways to do exhibitions. Uh, some exhibitions are uh, uh, um, juxtaposition of object. Uh, that exist uh, independently from each other, uh, with connection with each other. Uh, and that's, uh, I would say, the, the, the old school way of curating. Uh, and then you have started about, I would say, in the early 90s, a, a different generation of artists, and, and Doug is part of his generation, started to to, to think of the exhibition differently and wanted to, to push a little bit what an exhibition can do. And the exhibition became, you might not agree with that, but a medium mm -hmm. itself, or the exhibition became a work of art. Uh, and the idea that uh, and one of our common friends, the artist, an artist named Philippe Pareno, said an exhibition <coughs> is like a film without a camera. So you enter the set, and you, you enter this landscape, and you inhabit it, and you become a protagonist. And I think in many ways, the exhibition, whether here or uh, in, in Los Angeles, follow this mode, yeah. that it, yeah. it's a work on its own, uh, composed of other works. The other thing I would like to add, because I think it follows this idea of pushing the limit of uh, uh, what an exhibition can do, it's also pushing the limit of what a museum can do. When, uh, when Doug approached me with this idea of um, expanding beyond what we can contain in the museum, uh, of course, it's extremely exciting, and uh, that's actually why we do what we do. Uh, but we also realize that very often the artists are way ahead of us. Uh, and I'm very happy that we figure out how to do it. Uh, you shouldn't give Mocha or myself too much credit about it uh, because it's, we, re we were not 
really equipped. And we needed to, I mean, the studio was extremely important for us to achieve this project, this organization that you mentioned, Parley for the Ocean, was extremely important. But for me, the realization that I could see with this project the limitation mm -hmm. of what a, a museum can do. So should we go underwater? Let's take a dive. Let's take a dive. A bigger splash. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can we call the lights, please?
Nice. Um, <clears throat> I. Uh, I, I went this afternoon. I, I thought about this piece this afternoon. I, I went to see the uh, the Louis Kahn exhibition across the street at the Kimball. I don't know if you had a chance uh -huh. to go see it. And there is a quote on the wall that, for me, <clears throat> kind of illustrates um, very much the way the way you work and think. It's um, the quote is: "We need nature." But nature does not need us. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would like to apply that to art and museums. Museums need art and artists. But art and artists really don't need museum. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you want to comment on that? <laughs> uh, well, that's, that's, a, uh, that's an open-ended question. <laughs> uh, but I think that, you know, I, I mean, I think to, to kind of zoom up for a second and to really you know, talk about art and culture, you know, in a kind of wider perspective. You know, it's interesting. I mean, we were having a conversation in the lobby before, and we were talking about really kind of dividing art into past, present, future. And if we look at it that way, for example, you know, we see that, you know, if it was 50 years ago, the contemporary art of the moment is now modernism. You know, art is always in the present, but it's also, it's a kind of way of seeing time, really. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think in a lot of ways we, we find ourselves asking that question, you know, what is the value of art now? It's, it's 2017. We're moving fast into the future. We're in a new condition. We're living in a, in a new environment in terms of how we connect with each other, how we speak, how we consume information. So um, let, let's apply that to this piece. Yeah. So, so like, what the value of art now? So you, uh, you just realize this piece, and you say it's going to be uh, relocated in, in the Maldives. So um, how do you see this work of art? First, do you still consider it a work of art? Uh, or is it a work of something, uh, of something else? Um, and what, when you, after you done, you've done it, what, what, what did you learn from it? Mm -hmm. And what did you expect from the people who went to visit it? What do you think they, 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 they left with? One thing that you didn't mention, that the, the, the piece was also each of the architecture were equipped with cameras right. so that there were live feed and you could actually see, experience the piece without being in the water. Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, um, a, lot of, a lot of the works that I make um, are, are really kind of, they're, they're restless works and they're trying to explore the idea of time, mm -hmm. how we encounter time. And, you know, if we go upstairs for a moment, you know, we walk into the first room and the work is song one. Uh, the circular piece, and um, you know, it's 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 been very interesting for me watching people watch this work because almost everybody kind of enters at a different point. You kind of come in at a different scene, and you know, some someone may stay longer, someone may may you know, walk out immediately. But um, but 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 that idea that that you can somehow go beyond looking at a work, but you can kind of go inside it, and you can be with it, and you can be in dialogue with it. Um, I think I'm very interested in the idea of dialogue versus monologue. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, in some ways, uh, some art by nature is, is very much a monologue. You, you see it, and you know, it's telling you something. And, um, and I, I'm, I'm more interested in finding ways to break the screen, to, to empower the viewer, to allow the viewer to really you know, have, have, a, have a discussion, have an encounter. Um, be inside, be around um, the idea of the work. Mm -hmm. So I think for that reason, in a lot of ways, uh, my, my works often, I was going to say they, how, how they start, but I really don't know how they start. <laughs> well, it's, that was one of my questions. So, um, um, where does it start, though? So, well, I did something you. funny. Uh, sorry. Uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, Doug did a piece called The Source. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I actually feed on what you just said. And in this piece, uh, Doug actually staged a series of fascinating dialogues with some of the most brilliant creative minds around, from Jacques Herzog, the architect, uh, Jack White, uh, the artist mentioned Philippe Parreno, um, 
it was an, an incredible uh, group of uh, people. It became an installation where the sense of dialogue and collaboration and feeding of each other is at the center. Um, so I, I actually took all the questions you asked to these people, and I was planning <laughs> to ask them to you to turn the table uh -huh, I see. on you. Well, it's a circular table. Uh, but I think the, 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 uh, the key point here uh, is uh, through this dialogue, you're really interested in the uh, the process of creativity. Yeah, yeah. So now I'm going to turn the question back at you. Yeah. Where does it start? Where, you know, yeah. where, what, what's the first uh, uh, sparkle yeah. that uh, leads you in a direction? You're, you know, we're talking in the lobby and you say, well, I'm looking for this place here I cannot find and maybe it's going to trigger something that, yeah. for a new project. So uh, how does it work? I mean, I think, I think you, you find yourself, I mean, art comes out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. It comes out of restlessness, I think. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not really something you do. It's just something that, that kind of is. And um, in a lot of ways, you know, I mean, that, that question, the starting point for an artwork is, is, is so different for every person. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think when we were doing the Project The Source, we, um, I, I conducted uh, is about 29 conversations with different artists, architects, filmmakers, and, um, you know, and these were all kind of, we filmed them, they're like short films, almost like road trips through someone's process and idea. And it was a fascinating project for me because all of a sudden the tables were turned. Yeah, and, um, take back your you know, table. And, and I could really, um, you know, I, I had this kind of passport to talk to men and women who I'm fascinated by and to really kind of unearth where it comes from. And, and the interesting thing about the project was there was no singular answer. You know, mm -hmm. I think everybody has their own process. And I mean, I think for myself, um, you know, uh, an exhibition like Upstairs uh, spans a, a, a quite large amount of time. I think the earliest piece is uh, 97 or something. 96. 96. 1896. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I've shaved. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, um, and, and, and when I walk through it, it's very strange because all of these works have very different, the, the process is very different, the journey is very different. Um, but the one thing that I do notice that they have in common is, for me, it's, it's about constantly moving forward. And I see that, that every artwork, it starts with a seed. The seed is an idea, a concept, an impulse maybe. But, but at a certain point, that impulse grows and it grows and it grows. And, and it starts to take over. It starts to tell you what it needs. Um, how it needs to be formed, where it's going to be, what it consists of. Um, you know, there's an amazing scene in the first film, Song One, the first installation, and um, you know, we we filmed that piece for you know really a long time, uh, eight weeks or something, and um, about halfway through it, I, I had this image in my mind that was so indelible. It was an uh, uh, older woman who was relatively frail in a parking lot, um, you know, a cappella, just kind of speaking the song, and. I, I couldn't get this image out of my mind. And it was one of those things where, you know, at first you're somewhat haunted by it. Then you say, how do we find this person? Does she exist? And, you know, I, I looked high and low. I, I talked to everyone I knew, you know. And, and finally, you know, um, I couldn't sleep. So I, um, I, you know, I, I was awake and I go, you know, really early to the local coffee house or something like that. And, you know, the place is just open and there's a, there's a log sitting outside and the woman is sitting there. And she's just sitting there, like exactly the exact person. And um, I just walked up to her and I said, you know, excuse me, um, can you sing? And she said, yeah, I can sing in the shower. And um, I said, well, can you sing this song? It's called I Only Have Eyes For You. And she said, yeah, I can sing that song. And I said, can I pick you up, you know, like 7 o'clock tonight? And, um, and can you sing this, you know, walking through this, uh, you know, Save-On parking lot or something? Yeah. So she's in the film. And, 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 and it's, 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 it's interesting because sometimes things are so organic like that. It's like this like root system. And one thing just leads to another, like, like in a dominoes-like way. Other projects are, are very different. There's a, a, a brief documentation upstairs of a piece called Sonic Pavilion. Um, the Sonic Pavilion was a work which I made about a decade ago in Brazil. It's a, a jungle hillside that looks down into this kind of vast, vast uh, perspective. And I... I wanted to make a work that, that really kind of shocked you into the presence. And I thought about this idea that really our lives are kind of consumed with 
the past and the anxiety of the future, but very often we're not in the present. And you know, we walk around kind of um, conscious of all these different things. We feel that everything's in flux, everything's changing all the time. But one of the things that's, that's absolutely stable is what we're standing on, the earth, the room, the, the chair I'm sitting on. You just kind of take that for granted. So I thought about that, I thought, I thought really, we're on a planet that's always in motion. It's always moving, it's always in flux. And if you could make a work somehow that would address that, it would maybe, it would bring you into a different consciousness, even for a fleeting moment. So this was a situation that was so different than a long process-based work. The idea was very immediate. It was, you know, we need to make this work. We need to drill, um, you know, close to a mile into the earth. Um, we need this 700-foot uh, uh, deep hole to have microphones, geological microphones in it, so that as the planet's in motion the t and the plates are shifting, the sound is amplified into this pavilion. So you can be inside this 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 this, this structure, this circular glass structure, looking out into the forest, but hearing the earth below you in motion. And, and that was an example where, you know, that idea was so, um, for me, it was so instantaneous, but then it took four to five years to make. You know, so you just dedicate this amount of time to, to really, you know, bring something to fruition. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I think that, that going back to, to one other metaphor that we just touched upon was that idea of the seed of the idea. But, but the seed is really, what does a seed grow? A seed grows roots. Roots grow a tree, for example. A tree might have many branches and limbs. Eventually, it becomes wider and wider. And I think that, that that's really how I kind of view art making. And I've never made one work at a time. And I've always seen that there's a responsibility that you have to yourself to try to take ideas to a point that's as extreme as they need to be, as uncompromising as they need to be. And at a certain point along the journey often, I think the work kind of, at times, the work kind of takes over and it starts really um, authoring itself. And that's a very strange place to be in um, when you see that go down. And, um, and I think that, that, that if you embrace a process that's very nonlinear, that's very wide, like this kind of metaphoric tree that I'm describing, you recognize that, that you can take greater risks and move further in certain directions if you know you might be doing something before or after this that's way over here. If you're doing something, um, you know, for me, working on um, the exhibition here with uh, the, the museums was really, it was a fascinating journey, but it also gave me um, the kind of, um, the strength to make the underwater pavilions. You know, because I felt that now we have something which is inside a museum, I, it can be shared, it's this body of work, it's, it's physical, and, it's, and, it's, and, and it can be you know, kind, of, kind of given away, then, then we should go over here and we should, we should look at a, a, another possibility. And um, there's another piece that I'd love to show also. But you probably want to talk more because you have this great, it's not actually not a red book, so it works. I am just going to go anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just answered three of my questions that I didn't even ask to ask. So it's like what you say. I the up. work is taking over. I'm like, yeah, just go ahead. Uh, I'm going to say yes two or three times. Um, uh, Sorry, I'm talking off my track now. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, maybe we should. Riding on the rails of a, of a crazy train. Sorry? Station to station. Station to station. <laughs> well, that was extreme. That was an extreme project. Yeah. That's also a project that actually uh, only existed as because you, f you frame dialogue. Uh, I mean, you should describe it, but yeah, you should describe it before we, we, we talk about it, because I think it really uh, informed, again, about the way your mind uh, uh, operates, that nothing happened in isolation. Well, um, uh, <laughs> no, my mind operates. But, um, but, but, but there are doctors for that. We'll yeah, yeah I, I need to see one. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, um, Station of Stations, the work that uh, Philippe is uh, referencing, was a piece that we did about um, maybe four years ago now. And it was, um, it kind of was a work that was really born out of frustration with the system, with the culture system. And um, I found it very 
uh, interesting that you know we can all have dinner together tonight, and that conversation that we have it will range to, to cinema, to something we read, to a, a music we heard. All of these things are kind of they're on the table, and we all talk about them without even thinking that there's separation. Um, however, often when you look into culture, you see that things are siloed. They're kind of like glasses on this table, and you know, contemporary art may be over here, maybe music's over here, one genre of music. Over here is a different genre of music. It was this kind of huge separation. And I think in a lot of ways that's due to um, the capitalist system. There was a kind of financial system that surrounds all the mediums. And yet when you talk to people who are making things, they often they are inspired by many different mediums simultaneously. I thought about this, and I thought about the idea that really, when you look back on a year and you say, you know, what was outstanding of last year? What were like two things or three things for you? You know, it might have been you know, a great film you saw, but it's probably a great conversation you had. You know, and just sitting at a wood table with a friend, like late at night, and like everything's everything's laid out. So I thought, is there something I can do about this? Can I could I make a project that kind of takes out the the system and segregation out of culture, and it empowers the people who are making things and the audience, and it kind of creates a direct connection. So I thought, how do you do this? And I thought, I thought first of all, there's kind of two principles that, that keep that separation. You know, one is the idea of place, that you know, there might be an artist from Dallas who's here, and an artist from New York who's there, and somehow, for some reason, they're framed by where they live, maybe, or their habitat. Um, and the other thing is, is, is medium. So I thought, I thought you know, if we can make a project that's, that's nomadic, so it's, no one has a sense of place. Everyone's on the adventure together, and everything's constantly new. And if we can also say, everyone who's part of this project is, you don't bring something you've made before, just make something. If it's a failure, it's okay if it's a success, but just experiment, make something. So anyways, long story short, we, our studio spent a couple of years and we organized a train, and this train went from the East Coast, it went 4,000 miles across America and ended in the Bay Area. And um, the train was, um, it, we recreated it, so different train cars were um, recording studios for musicians or um, editing suites or film studios. So the whole thing was a kind of nomadic studio. And then, um, you know, as, as you guys know, when you go into a lot of, um, you know, train stations these days, they're, they're kind of WPA era. There might be a tumbleweed blowing by and, like, one guy sleeping on the bench. You know, it's, it's not really a mecca. And, um, and I, thought, I thought, so there's all these incredible train stations across America. We, we can stop for one night only in each one, and we'll use it like you would use an exploded museum will have a happening in each one, and we'll have different musicians playing in each one, and we'll work with local artists and musicians, and we'll connect this to different museums along the way. So long story short, we, we made this journey. It was called Station to Station, and it was something that was really about kind of almost cutting out the, the middle person and just having this direct relationship between place, audience, and creator, and trying to create these moments that were, that were fleeting, but they were kind of flammable. Um, so that's very telling about the way the the way you work. I mean, when when we were few things that you know, when when first when I, we started to talk about the exhibition, Doug told me, well, I'm not sure I have enough work to make a retrospective or a survey, and I was like, really? Like, and say, yeah, I never look back. I never look back. I'm not, you know, I don't do this thing. So what was, was very interesting to me that the, uh, um, your awareness of everything you have achieved was almost, was irrelevant to you. Uh, the only thing that mattered and still matters is moving forward. This idea of, is that, an, is that progress? Are you interested in progress? <laughs> the notion of, you know, uh, future and progress. Do you, do you think about the future or do you think about now? In, uh, I was thinking of that this morning. In, the, uh, uh, in Electric Earth, the character says, yeah. this is the only now we get. This is the only yeah. now I get. And I, I, was, I always thought of you thinking of you know, this motion forward. And then I was like, maybe it's not that. Maybe it's just making the best of what's happening right now. And then, then we'll see. Well, I think, I think in a lot of ways, for me, the, the, the most powerful experiences I've had with art of, of any form is when I'm encountering something where there just is no, there's nothing except for that 
sense of presence just right there in the moment. And the ability for something, you know, whether it's, you know, Glenn Gould playing Bach or whether it's, it's an incredible moment in a film that just lasts this long. <laughs> but it's something that engages you so much that everything else erases. You know, not something that makes you think of something else, not something that, that is a representation or, or, or is a romantic of something, but something that just literally engages you in the present. And I think in a lot of ways for me, that's one of the most fleeting and valuable uh, kind of passages that, that I can have. I think I, you say that, but I also think the work is actually quite romantic. Mm -hmm. You know, in almost in a, a old traditional way. French. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's German romanticism. <laughs> uh, My name's not Casper David Friedrich. No, but there is a little bit of that. I mean, like if I look at the um, uh, the photo series, Ninety Nine yeah. Cents Dream. Yeah. It's uh, it's they are very. There's something romantic about them. The landscape is there, like, you know, yeah. most of the work is, I mean, the landscape comes all the time. You have people in front of the landscape contemp I mean, contemplating, you know, time passing. So there is this quality in the work of romanticism. Are you, are you pushing, pushing it back? No, I'm, I'm absorbing it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about music, because uh, as I was giving tours this morning, a lot of people were asking, you know, uh -huh. What are the, the sources of influence? Uh, where, where, again, that goes back, it goes back to this question, where does all these uh, ideas come from, or structure mm. uh, come from? And uh, for me, it goes to a very specific place, mm. and it's your relationship with, with music. And as if music was the overall structure that you follow, Mm -hmm. uh, when you produce a work that could be an underwater pavilion uh, or uh, or song one, yeah, yeah, and uh, and I, I mentioned the word structure because uh, you know you and me we had the great privilege to go visit Terry Riley yeah. together, and the more I think about it, I think actually if there is if you, if I draw a line uh, mm -hmm. from you know. Influence to what you're doing right now. The first, the first, the beginning of the line would be Terry Riley. Mm -hmm. Is that a total, a total misunderstanding? No, no. I think it's, I think it's, it's fascinating. Um, for anyone who doesn't know who uh, Philippe's talking about, Terry Riley is a, um, a composer. who's 82 now. He's a. Uh, um, often seen as a, uh, one of the inventors of minimalist music, as the first person to write a piece of minimalist music. But um, his, his career kind of spans um, a series of incredible um, collaborations with artists such as uh, Bruce Conner and Walter DeMaria. Um, he's inventive in the sense that you know, he's one of the forefathers of electronic music, one of the birth of sampling. Um, it just kind of goes on. But you know, Terry is someone who um, uh, I, I came across through his music, and eventually we became uh, very close friends. And um, and I think you know what, what you're kind of alluding to in a certain way is um, you know if, if we do look at the works upstairs, I have to say that in a lot of ways I find myself um, sometimes looking more at the structure of music than the structure of, of art. Mm -hmm. And um, the first piece that we encounter is called Twilight. It's this public payphone which is up there, kind of glowing and living its own life. But Twilight is not a passive sculpture. It's not just there lighting up. It's actually sensing the room around it. It's a generative sculpture. So every viewer that walks up or around it, it's, it knows how close you are, how many people are around it. And that generates different patterns and pulses of light and illumination from inside it. So essentially, there's a possibility the sculpture can never repeat itself. That could always be different and kind of living its own life in a very quiet and subtle way. And you know, to, to do this, you know, it was, it was a, a very challenging project to make. And I remember finding myself thinking about how do you compose light? And how do you make patterns of light that will you know, do what it needed to do in a way, in my mind's eye. So I found myself listening to music. And I actually was, um, it was interesting, because I, I remember I called Terry mm -hmm. about that. I said, you know, I said, I'm in this conundrum, you know, I've got, I'm working on this piece and it, it needs to have a certain rhythm, but it's also, it's living, so it's gotta be able to change. We were really kind of looking at minimalist music structures and applying them to a light sculpture. 
And that was much closer for me. It was a, a much better dialogue and tool than, than, than looking at um, you know, other things that I found more in the visual realm. Mm -hmm. You know, but I think I think it's always different, you know. And I, I do want to, before uh, our time's up, um, I, I do want to show a short clip of a new work. Um, this is the most recent piece that we've made, and um, it's once again it's a very short clip. But um, hey, hey um, up there in the projection booth, can can you make it twice as loud? Thank you. Yeah, he gave me the thumbs up. I, I, all I saw was a little illuminated thumbs up. <laughs> but, um, but, but, but this is a very different work again. Oh, hold on. Um, this is a very work, different work again because um, you know, this, this, this work kind of moves in the trajectory of, of creating art which is continuously changing, which is living in a certain way. And um, uh, this is a work that we did in the mountains above the desert in California. Um, it's a work which um, is, exists in the form of a suburban house. Um, and it's um, very specifically located in uh, a destination that has a kind of panoramic view and looks down into sprawling suburbia and then where the suburbia ends and the kind of undeveloped west begins. And without saying any more, um, maybe we have a little, a little slice of this piece of hummus. There's one thing that I, I just mentioned later.
Well, thank you so much for your time tonight and uh, being here. And um, it means a lot, and I'm uh, really grateful to have an exhibition here in Fort Worth. Thanks. And uh, thank you. This is in Palm Spring. If you go on the other side, go see it. Please go see the exhibition. Um, thank you, Doug, for doing that. I <laughs> really enjoy doing this exercise with you because I, I barely have to talk. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I really hope that the dialogue Thanks. is going to continue. Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everybody.